Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, president of ATOA, the Artist Talk on Art. This is our 85th virtual open studio. Um, this is the format we moved to since COVID, which is about a year and a half uh, in our rear view mirror now. Uh, in the past, since 1975, all of our talks have been live in the Lower West Side of New York City. Um, we have changed things up uh, for the safety of our audience. And this is just one example of our last 85 talks. Um, ATOA is a 501c3. All of our talks are free. If you'd like to contribute, there's information on our website. As well, our website has a link to our YouTube channel. This talk will be available on YouTube in about a day or two. And it also has a calendar showing future talks. And as well, you can go look and see previous talks on our calendar also. Um, tonight's talk, Celebrating the Winter Solstice, features six artists uh, discussing the cosmos and their work around it. Lois Bender has organized this talk. Um, everyone's gonna have about 10 minutes to present. I do encourage everybody to mute themselves because we have a way of thinking we can hear what is being said on our end, but our audio is very sensitive. So I first want to thank Lois and the six artists, Tamara Windham, Karen Fitzgerald, Kristen Reed, the Daria Dorosh, sorry about the pronunciation, Andra Samuelson and Sandra Taggart. I want to thank you beforehand. And of course, I want to thank everybody that's here. We have a nice group, so far 44 people. And I thank everybody, because as I always say, time is our most valuable and it is our limited commodity that we have to work with. And so I appreciate it. Um, there is a chat feature. Feel free to write anything in the chat. We're going to, each artist is going to present for about 10 minutes. And we'll have about one minute after each artist artists to ask questions. And then at the very end, we will have some time for open questions. Um, I'm gonna sort of hand the ball off to Lois Bender. And again, thank you, Lois, for organizing this. I do wanna let everybody know, coming in 2022, we have a new time. Instead of six o'clock, it'll be a 7 p.m. start. We have a new Zoom link. That'll be coming out soon. And by the way, everything is on our website. But when that comes out, it will be on our website. And uh, we are not going back to live talk until the earliest, the earliest April 1st. So be aware if you're not muted, we can hear you. Um, and you know, just be respectful, but I see everybody's doing a great job. Lois, thanks so much. Welcome, tell us a little bit about the show. And uh, again, thank you. Well, thank you, Barry. It's a pleasure to be here and introduce you to all the work by these amazing artists. And so welcome to our panel discussion entitled Celebrating the Solstice, Six Artists Visit the Cosmos. Our presentation will explore, explore art about the cosmos as we celebrate the returning of light, the winter solstice. We humans cluster around uh, together uh, for warmth and communal so solidarity on this day of least daylight. The six artists who are fascinated by the immense mystery, um, mysteries of this infinite subject show their curiosity and creative imagination in their inspired work. I am the moderator, Lois Bender. Uh, we um, just introduced our artists by name and they will um, discuss the cosmos and other cosmologies in their contemporary aesthetic practices from the physical to the spiritual in art. The story of the cosmos is a story of, of creation. We humans make and speculate many creation stories, mythologies, and cosmologies to explain and figure out the primal questions of how our existence and our origins came into being beyond this planet, this universe, and the infinite cosmic system. The cosmos exists in our consciousness. Even though, uh, even though cutting edge science and technology of satellites like the Hubble telescope attempt to answer questions about the physical cosmos. We ask, what about the spiritual dimension? Why have we failed to find other life forms across the cosmos? From this perspective, we will see the visions of six artists whose work delves into the physical and spiritual dimensions of cosmologies. And first we'd like to show a few examples and set the context in art history uh, for our talk. Throughout human history of recorded image making since ancient times, we have a remarkable legacy of art about the cosmos. We have about 10 slides 
and the artists are going to chime in and uh, talk about um, the artwork for uh, five minutes. And then we'll start with Tamara. So I'll share my screen and, okay. Do you see my screen, everyone? Yes. Okay, great, okay. Well, the art examples we have are ranged from the Aboriginal art, Aztec, Egyptian, medieval, Christian, and modern views. And the first artwork we are going to show will be the Aboriginal art of New Zealand and Australia. Um, this artwork is by San, uh, William Sandy Bush Tucker. It's dreaming, uh, it's acrylic on canvas. And uh, Karen has supplied this um, slide of this cosmic view of the world of these um, Aboriginal peoples. Yeah, so I mean, this image is a beautiful abstract image and it, it is one of, you know, hundreds, thousands that the Aboriginal people have produced and they have an abstract language that really connects them physically to their world. Um, dreaming is a Western term. It's not an Aboriginal term. And it's the best that Westerners could do to name the kind of physical and conceptual space that the Aboriginal people exist in. They tell their stories to one another visually, um, and that takes on a very um, sometimes arcane, sometimes idiosyncratic, and always complex visual vocabulary. It's extremely abstract, um, and it's it's beautiful. It's had great influence across. Um, the Western world across many cultures, actually. Um, it's a little hard to penetrate. And I, you know, suggested this slide because it, it looks so contemporary, it looks so Western, but, you know, beneath it is its own physicality and its own visual language. And the form is determinant. It's determinant to say what it wants to say um, about the cosmology that the uh, Aboriginals exist in. Mm. Thank you, Karen. I'll move on and we're going to look at the Aztec uh, sun icon. It's like a sundial, it's a calendar. And the calendar is um, telling us about their world. Um, the uh, world. I'd like to say it's not actually a calendar. It uses calendrical glyphs to reference the cyclical concepts of time and the relationship to the cosmic mythology of, of the Aztecs. And the central face is the solar deity, Tonatiu. I'm glad that you cleared that up. <laughs> Thank uh, you, so much, Tamara. If anyone else has something to say, we'll move on. Um, okay, and this is a, a slide that Tamara has uh, provided. This is the... Uh, Nui Chapel ceiling in the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. And you'll see a small face uh, just below the center that's Hathor. But if the main figure is Newt, the, the sky goddess, in the lower right, you see her hands and you follow her arms up and her head is in the upper right and her body goes across and then her legs go down to her feet at the lower left. So she is the sky arching across the earth and at her uh, hips is the rising sun with the sunbeams coming down to the earth and at her, and that's the rising sun and the setting sun is at her mouth. She swallows the sun at night and gives birth in the morning. It's extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, also, this is another slide Tamara has provided. This is the um, funerary stele of Lady Taparet. And you can see her on the right and she's worshiping the god Amun. But over them is arched the sky goddess Newt her hands are on the lower right and she arches across to I'm her, trying to. Her feet are on the lower left and you can see she's painted blue and there are stars on her body. Uh, her, she's giving birth to the sun at the upper left. The sun 
uh, at the very top is at noon. And then on the right, the sun at her mouth, she's about to swallow the sun at sunset. That's beautiful. Uh, this is an artwork from the Middle Ages by the famous visionary Hildegard von Bingen, who was uh, in, um, in in the Christian world, one of the um, important illuminaries who worked with naturalism. Um, this is from an illuminated manuscript showing the earth with the cosmic trees centering that center globe and then waters around it and then the sky. Would anyone else like to offer more about this? Uh, the central circle looks very much like uh, Malkuth and the uh, Kabbalah tree of life, Malkuth representing the earth and is usually divided into four. And it's showing the four seasons uh, going around the central circle. And then you have uh, uh, animal heads representing wind. I, I'm not sure. I don't think they're, I don't think they're astrological signs, but they're all showing different winds and, uh, and maybe water. The central circle is also split into um, a primary vertical and a primary horizontal, which is a primordial orientation of human consciousness on earth the horizon between the sky and the earth and the verticality of our species. And also Hildegard is in the lower left and she's recording her vision. And you see at the bottom, the hand of God rolling out a scroll toward her. Hmm. Wonderful, those are wonderful details. Thank you, it's fantastic. Uh, and here we have astrology represented in the figure. And uh, Tamara has um, these. This is, this is a, an astrological and medical uh, illustration by Nicholas of Lynn from 1424. And uh, medieval medicine believed that astrological signs ruled different parts of the body. So you have Aries, Aries, uh, influencing the head and Taurus, the neck, and then uh, Cancer and all the way down to Pisces at the feet. And when a, a doctor would, would uh, want to do a cure for a patient, he would also check the astrology uh, and time the uh, medication to correspond with um, the astrological chart that was affecting which part of the body. So the idea was that the human body was very much connected with, with uh, the universe, with the stars and the sky. Thank you. And this famous um, artwork is the creation of the world and the expulsion from paradise by Giovanni di Paola. Uh, it, the artwork is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, showing Adam and Eve uh, being expelled. Uh, but on the left side, we have an image of the Earth circled by uh, the different levels of planets and the entire universe. And uh, someone else would please like to add more to that description, if you may. Uh, sure. Okay. Sure. This is this is. Um you know, our first recorded um, instance where we, we know that uh, God created abstract art, handed it down. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> uh, well, there's a, a map of the world in the middle and the very top mm -hmm. is the Garden of Eden with four rivers coming down. And on the lower right, you see the same four rivers uh, issuing out from the Garden of Eden. And the concentric circles uh, represent the four elements, the known planets, and then the constellations of the zodiac on the outer ring. 
And this is at the advent before the discovery by Columbus, uh, 1445. So this is the sense of the worldview of Christianity at the time. Mm -hmm. um, then following another century or two, we have the magnificent ceilings of the Baroque period. And in Rome, we have Fra Angel, uh, Andrea Pozzo working at the Church of St. Ignatius. And I think that uh, Sandra liked this picture in terms of the conception of the vast world of the heavens and the skies in this Christian format. Sandy? Is she available? I, yeah, I just was muted. Yeah, I, I, I when I, after my first year in art school, I bicycled through Europe to, uh, to look at Caravaggio. And I, I think I saw every Caravaggio that, there, that was there, but I discovered these domed ceilings by accident and they completely influenced the rest of my life because I just loved how an artist was able to make that sense of infinite space. And I enjoyed that people could get sucked into it, but I really, it, I, I just was so impressed with that ability to render space, which I think was, part of what that period was famous for, really. The yeah, theatrical exaggeration and the fact that the ceiling is actually flat and what an illusion, of course, with perspective. Yeah, and, just like, and it just knocked me out. I mean, it still knocks me out. Fantastic. Well, there's a sky for you. All right. Yeah. Finally, we have one or two slides. We have the modern era where we have just not only Hilma, Hilma of Clint, Clint, but we have Kandinsky to balance out the founders of possibly um, total abstraction. And um, they bring us up to date. We have one more slide. Does anyone want to talk about these two? They do represent a modern point of view. I just want to say I love the Kandinsky. <laughs> uh, well, Helma of Clint uh, studied um, uh, spirituality and, and uh, did a lot of meditation and channeling of, of uh, spiritual entities uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so all of these have, have deep spiritual content. Yes, there is a connection with the other world. I want to go to the last slide which is um, uh, Kosama and where if you, no one, I think everyone knows the infinity rooms through the modern technology, um, the sense of mirrors, glass, um, the lights. And um, this brings us up to today and the innovations going forward. Anyone want to comment? And if we don't, we'll start talking about uh, Tamara's work. I think, okay, we'll go right into speaking about Tamara's work. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. And um, uh, thank you um, everyone for helping just give an art historical context to our talk. And um, for now, I'd like to ask Tamara to present her work. Thank you, Tamara. Sure, uh, let's see, how do I? Hi, so I'm Tamara Wyndham, and I make body prints and hand prints by applying paint either to my own skin or to a model skin, and then pressing or rubbing it onto paper or cloth. And I've done a lot of hand prints, and my work is all about connecting the body with the spirit and the aura, and then from there to the cosmos and to the the divine. And uh, I make a body print by uh, applying paint to the model here. And then afterward, I make an aura using a splattered paint technique. And in this one, I felt that the aura made me think of the clouds of dust that condensed to form the birth of a star. Uh, which is where I got the title. And of course, I'm anthropomorphizing an astronomical event, but that's what uh, mythology does, that we take something that's greater than human understanding and render it in something uh, that humans can understand that relate to us. 
this is the sky goddess who is called the Egyptian sky goddess who is called Nut or Nuit. Nuit is the French word for night. And uh, I got one of my tallest friends to pose for this as she's often uh, shown as being very tall and stretched out across the sky. And uh, this, I'm comparing her with an ancient Egyptian work. Uh, the, she was, the sky goddess was often depicted on the inside of the lid of a coffin so that the deceased in the coffin would be looking up at the mother goddess who's going to welcome them into the afterlife. And here Nuit is painted a dark sky blue with uh, golden stars. And she has just swallowed the sun at sunset. So it's right around her neck. And then at her pubic area, which is unusual here, she's giving birth to the moon. As you can see, there's a, a crescent. And along the left and the right are the hours of the night and the day. The night on the left, the figures are holding stars, the small figures. And the small figures on the right are holding a sun disk. So, so those are the hours of the day and the night. So the whole cosmos is um, enclosing and protecting uh, the mummy. Uh, this is my artwork again, uh, going back uh, of the sky goddess. And on uh, the left is what I start with a, a very clear stencil. And then on the right, I like to obscure it. The birth is the dawn and the Egyptians connected the scarab beetle with the dawn. The scarab is active at night and finishes its activity at dawn and so people tended to see them at dawn. So the scarab is in a boat pushing the sun and the idea was that the gods traveled in a boat across the sky. And uh, then at sunset she swallows the sun. So this is the sun god Ra and the boat headed toward her mouth. And you can see again, I have the, on the right is what I begin with, a stencil with the sun god that has a, the head of a hawk and is seated in a squatting position and the sun over his head and he's in the boat. And I like to co cover it with a translucent layer of paint that obscures it and makes it more mysterious. Um, and that's the whole painting again. And I like to hang, I love to hang this painting on the ceiling. It's, it works really well. Um, and I love to lie on the floor and, and look up at it. Uh, this is uh, called the Milk Moon. It was made as a performance art in May. And uh, the cows have been eating, um, dry hay all winter. And in May is when they get to eat fresh green grass. And so the milk becomes very, very rich and nutritious after um, going all winter. Uh, so it was a very exciting time for uh, people and farming people in Europe. And um, uh, we started the performance, I, get, I had them do a, a meditation called the Tower of Light. And um, I didn't make up the, edit, the meditation. It's a traditional meditation uh, where you imagine a, a sphere of light above your white light above your head while you're encased in a blue egg shaped oval shape. And then you imagine the light entering your body and filling your body and then filling the whole interior of the egg with light. And it's a very wonderful meditation that fills you with energy and, and uh, feels very cleansing and also very protective. And I altered it slightly to, to uh, imagine it, the white light being the moon and moonlight since we were doing this on the full moon. 
And then after we did this meditation, I, I uh, put paint on my model that you can see here. While my friend um, Maya Darren was playing Tibetan singing bowls and gongs. And here's the resultant um, body print that we made as a performance. We made a second performance of the blood moon. Uh, and of course, um, the female body, uh, the menstrual cycle is very influenced both by moonlight and the moon's gravity. And um, the, the menstrual cycle and the, the cycle of the moon being about 28 days. And um, there was a, a happy accident, I guess. Uh, the model was not centered in the middle of the cloth and I didn't have room to make a round moon shape. So I made an egg shape but of course, many creation myths describe the cosmos as a big egg and, and creation being uh, emerging from the egg. This is our card. Uh, Maya Darren did uh, a sound bath and David Mills read poetry while I was uh, painting the model. And I'm using acrylic paint, but there's a small amount of the model's menstrual blood mixed into the paint that, to make it um, magically potent. And uh, then I had assistants help me lower the cloth onto the model. And then I very gently rubbed um, the model to get the paint to uh, transfer onto the cloth. And then this was the immediate result of the performance. And then in my studio, I uh, make a mask with scraps of plastic uh, to form the egg shape and also to protect the body print from my splattering technique. And here is a, a detail of the finished work, which I just finished a few days ago. So this is my very newest work. And here's just a collage of all my work and I'll say thank you. And uh, as I said, my work is about connecting the body with the spirit and the aura, and then from there to the cosmos and the divine. Uh, let's see, how do I? Thank you. Let's... Uh, that was wonderful. Did I stop was... screen sharing? I, I did it for you. I did it for you. Okay. I think we're going to move on to Karen Fitzgerald just in the interest of time here. Um, keep in mind, you can use the chat for anything. Again, this is ATOA, Artists Talk on Art. If you'd like to present for the ATOA, take a look at our website. There's information how you can get the form and organize a talk yourself. Welcome, Karen. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Lois. And thanks, Tamara. That was a beautiful presentation of your work. Um, I totally get the um, um, when cows are turned out uh, to pasture in May. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm, and the first week that cows were out, we could taste, we could actually taste the fresh grass in the milk. It was extraordinary. So thank you for that reminder. Um, my work is not body-based, um, like Tamara's. Um, it has very little to do with, um, I guess, my own sense of my body. Um, but there is a sense of compression and expansion, uh, considering the scale of the universe that's present in my work. Um, so the first couple of images that we're going to see here um, come from a suite of work that was done in collaboration with composer Carl Maltzby. And this is the Sparrow's Eye Suite. There were 13 paintings that were produced. Um, and all of these paintings look very closely at the natural world, as well as the distance of the night sky. So the synchronicities, such as the partnering on the wings of butterflies with that of what's available in the night sky view, as well as the imaginative conjuring of what a sparrow might see through its eyes are present in each of these paintings. Um, so the suite again is called The Sparrow's Eye. Um, 
this uh, suite of work contains a kind of expansion and contraction of envisioning that is both abstract um, and referencing our natural world. Um, the suite was produced in the early years of the new century. It pre premiered at St. Bartholomew's Church on Martin Luther King Day in 2006. Carl wrote a stunning, beautiful uh, composition, musical composition uh, for so, um, of uh, a cappella choir. Um, and my images were pr projected onto a 15 foot screen. Uh, we timed the images to the composition of music. Um, and so it was, a, it was an interesting presentation. Um, so this painting is called The Sparrow's Eye Queen. Um, and uh, obviously it references the spots that we see on a butterfly um, with the spots we see in the night sky. Um, and there are a couple of other references present here. Uh, we see some um, uh, references to uh, um, the uh, astronomical, uh, um, there, there's the winter, <laughs> I'm losing my words, um, there's the winter um, uh, constellation in the central circle. And then there's another uh, set of concentric rings that reference the they're color coded and they reference the chakras that uh, many people who meditate uh, refer to. It's another sparrow's eye painting just called sparrow's eye black. And again, it uh, connects the dots on a butterfly's wings with the constellations in the night sky. And the central configuration is a reference to the mechanics of an eye. What does an eye look like? What does an eye see? Um, how is it set up to see? Um, after I finished that suite, I um, thought a lot about um, how what we see up in the sky and what we know about what's up in the sky um, is connected with our own, what we know on, within our hands grasp on the earth. Um, so this is just called Shell Red Nebula, and it conjoins the spiral of a snail's shell, a garden snail, with that of a very large nebula up in the dark of the night sky. A lot of the work I do um, evokes a kind of luminosity that is present not only in our natural world, but also in the cosmos. Uh, and so I you know, love looking at the kinds of images that come from the Hubble telescope, for example, and also the things that um, we see at hand in a plain garden. Um, across my mature work, I've made paintings about the moon as our companion in the solar system, the moon and its many phases have often also felt like a personal companion. When I was a girl growing up, I'd take one of the horses out for moonlight riding. There was a magic about those evenings and I still feel this energy when I'm out on a full moon evening. There's something about the presence of the moon that is hard to put into words maybe. Um, Many of the moon paintings that I have made across the years play with perceptual issues. Um, so for instance, this is called the shy moon and it's um, an oil painting with a 23 karat gold and palladium ground. And it is based on um, a moon you might see, a full moon on a foggy evening where the contours of the moon um, are reflected in clouds and become obscure. Um, and here I've given it kind of an emotional personification or interpretation of a mood that the moon may have. This is called the blue moon. Um, and it also is playing with what the moon looks like through our atmospheric um, interference. Sometimes fogs, clouds, um, other kinds of um, atmospheric uh, phenomenon um, obscure the moon, moon, the full moon, and make for really beautiful um, instances of presence. 
So many of the moon paintings that I make play with perceptual issues during the moon ish during the new moon, we don't actually see the moon. She is there, but the earth blocks light from falling on her surface. This is also true when we have an eclipse of the moon. Um, she may be invisible to us, but she's still up there. Um, and so this was, uh, this is called the darkened moon. And it was made when I watched a full eclipse of the moon. And it's a beautiful thing to stand out on a dark night and watch the moon go dark and then watch the moon come light again. And there are all kinds of beautiful things that play along the edge of the moon with light and with, um, in our own eyes, you know, after you look at something round in a, in a dark space, you kind of have this burned image on your retina. Um, and so there are all kinds of things that happen as time progresses and you watch this um, changing face of the moon going from pre-eclipse to eclipse to post-eclipse. This is called the day blind moon. And um, it's from a small set of paintings that I did a couple of years ago. Um, it borrows its title from a Wendell Berry poem where he references the day blind stars above us. So this painting does actually contain a moon and in person, sometimes digitally, you will find it with attention and careful looking. And so these kinds of paintings call into question not only perception, but our connection to physical matter and how physical form has its own voice. This is called the unbought loveliness of moon. Um, and there is a moon there. It's a little more visible than the previous image. There was a period of time where I did a lot of work on prepared paper. Um, and I was very interested in how the graphic quality of the prepared paper had a certain quality of energy that spoke to the quality of paint that I put on top of it. Um, and so this painting is a borrowed phrase from um, uh, a poet um, whose name just went out of my mind and I didn't put him down on my cheat sheet. So it will come back to me and hopefully I'll remember it before I stop talking. Um, about, about one more minute, Karen, okay? Yep, yep, we're almost done. Um, the newer work is a testament to the restless shifting of light and energy. We are limited in our perception of light, less so regarding energy. That is essentially what the cosmos is, light and energy sharing an endless dance. I began a sweep of work in 2019 titled What the Light Saw. This work is decidedly abstract, using Venetian plaster as a starting point and energy signature is troweled onto the surface using very thin layers of mica and or oil paint. The painting is developed layer by luminous layer. When finished, a ring of gold is added to the rim of the painting. I've used gold in my work since 2006, not as bling and all that bling might suggest, but as a nod to the, uh, the way of ancient civilizations used gold to signify something as sacred. Energy and light are sacred. The unity between matter and spirit is embedded in that understanding of this basic, basic stuff of the cosmos. Um, and so I wanna leave you with a poem, um, What You Cannot Hold. You who let yourselves feel, enter the breathing that is more than your own. Let it brush your cheeks as it divides and rejoins behind you. Blessed ones, whole ones, you where the heart begins. You are the bow that shoots the arrows and you are the target. Fear not the pain, let its weight fall back into the earth for heavy are the mountains, heavy the seas. The trees you planted in childhood have grown too heavy. You cannot bring them along. Give yourselves to the air, to what you cannot hold. Thank you. Very nicely done. Um, there are many nice comments in the chat. I'm not gonna read them off as I usually do, because we have a night packed with content. Just remind you all, this is ATOA, Artists Talk on Art, and this was organized by Lois Bender. We're gonna to move to Kristen Reed. Kristen, welcome. Thank you. And depending on 
um, Lois to show my slides since I was having a technical problem today. Lois, are you there? She's got you up and running. Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm starting with this slide which shows um, in the center cataclysmic cosmic events such as exploding supernovas and neutron star mergers and spiraling black holes. And to the right of that are cells in the human body. And to the left are some um, sacred geometry drawings that are very, very ancient. Um, can you change the slide, Lois? So I'd also like to share these four quotes. The first one from Nassim Haramein, who um, currently is the head of the Resonance Science Foundation. Biology is the feedback mechanism for the universe to learn more about itself. And what I like about this is it implies that the universe is learning and therefore conscious. The second one from Gamit, Amit Goswami, who's also um, a theoretical physicist, quantum physicist. Consciousness is the ground of all being. The next one is from Galileo, 16th century. Mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. And the last one, 20th century, Carl Jung. In all chaos, there is a cosmos. In all disorder, a secret order. Okay, next slide, please. So um, life pulled me away from my lifelong art practice for some time. And at the end of that time, I had learned um, a healing energy practice known as Reiki, which was developed in 1922 in Japan. Uh, Reiki involves the ability to do remote healing. And this really puzzled me. Uh, remote healing, the thought is that everything is energy and energy doesn't know the bounds of time and space. I was very curious how you could send healing to someone on the other side of the earth or how you could send healing to yourself or someone um, back in their childhood when they experienced a traumatic event to heal their present. So um, I started reading and trying, really trying to figure out how this worked and it took me to quantum physics. Um, suggesting the, uh, that observation creates a physical reality and a universal connectedness. The future affects the past and reality is beyond physicality. So many contemporary experts agree that there is a mystery in physics, something unexplainable. Science was always explainable before, but now it's not anymore. <laughs> And usually in quantum physics, there is an encounter with consciousness. So on the left side, you see um, a figure called the flower of life. This is a symbol that was, that's been found carved into stone in Egypt, in Tibet, in China, in Native in um, North America, in South America, in cultures that were very far apart, and at a time when there was no um, connectedness by sea or sky travel, how did that happen? So um, you know, I was looking what what is sacred geometry? It was ringing in my ears, and I was really interested in finding out what it was. So basically one definition is that it's a series of geometric shapes with a deeper uh, metaphysical meaning that help us explore the idea that the entire cosmos was created according to a specific geometric or mathematical plan that every single thing on the smallest and largest scale is a part of. So this, 
two-dimensional pattern, the flower of life is made up of 61 circles that signify creation. And within it are embedded many other um, sacred symbols that show the same representation of life and creation. The flower of life is said to be the basic template for everything in existence. All geometric forms can be found within it. And it reminds us of the unity of everything. We're all built from the same blueprint and all life on earth and in the universe is interconnected. Beyond all chaos, there's order, a blueprint that underlies the structure of everything, revealing itself through patterns, frequencies, ratios, and forms across disciplines, nature, science, music, math, art, the physical world, and the cosmos. Um, next slide. Oh, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> So from radiating from the center of the flower of life are 13 circles. These are called the fruit of life. And by connecting the center of each of these circles, you come up with another figure called Metatron's cube. The five platonic solids are hidden inside Metatron's cube. Symbolism is the language of mysteries. By symbols, humans have ever sought to communicate to each other those thoughts which transcend the limitations of language. Um, earlier tonight, Lois mentioned earth, air, fire, and water as elements of power. There's a fifth element called ether in the alchemical chemistry of early physics. Ether is believed to fill the universe beyond the terrestrial spheres, hence the element that fills the world of the cosmos. Next slide, please. Thank you. So each solid is represented here, the tetrahedron, the cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, icosahedron. They're, they're all nestled within Metatron's cube. And each one of them represents one of those elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether. So I started using these symbols that the ancients had used all over the world concurrently. Next slide, Lois, please. So this is um, part of a five-part series representing those elements. This one is fire or the star tetrahedron. This is from 2012. Next slide. This is air or the octahedron, also from 2012. These are on unstretched canvas. They're about 20 by 32. Next slide. I'm gonna buzz through these pretty fast to make up my time. Um, this is Metatron's maze from 2011, showing the uh, Metatron's cube in the next one. I was walking in Chinatown, they were pulling this big old steel pipe, like, I don't know, diameter of about five feet maybe, and a piece of skin from the pipe rusted, fell off in the street. I picked it up and took it home and painted part of the flower of life on it. And someone asked me if I had found it that way, um, which I did not. I thought that was pretty funny. This is called Cosmic Code from 2011. Next slide, please. Lois, thank you. This is the interstitial from 2012, um, acrylic on canvas. And you can go to the next one. This is called Event Horizon. Just about one more minute, Kristen. Thank okay. You. So the next slide. 
This is the seed. This is a painting. It's six by six feet, and it's in the lobby of the of the church, um, the first Presbyterian church where I think ATOA was meeting and the New York Artist Circle meets. So in this, you can see a lot of what I talked about: spiral galaxies, the fruit of life, dividing cells, an icosahedron for water, flower of life, nautilus shell. <laughs> That's from 2014. So this is when I started putting images into the work. And I had earlier been working with um, environmental issues and extinction of life on earth with images before I started doing these abstract paintings. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is unaccountable, sorry, Unaccountable Galaxies in 2015 also, uh, six by six feet. And this um, was done at the same time as the last one. Next slide. Next slide, Lois. It's a uh, moon halo, oh, twin flames, okay. Yeah, I can't see it, is it there? Twin flames is up, this will be the last slide. Oh, okay, well, let's skip over this then because I wanted to show the next one which is where images are really coming back into the work. I don't see it switching. Yeah, there we go. Oh, that's not where images are coming back in. The one after that, that's Sky Teacher. Um, this is Flight for Tomorrow, where images are coming back in. And yes, then this is a detail from Work in Progress. And the last one, I put in to show the figure in the circle, which reminds me of tomorrow's work. Okay, thank you. Very nice. Again, there are so many nice comments in the chat. Feel free to read them or to keep adding, but in the interest of time, we are gonna move on to Daria Darash. Did I get that right, Daria? I'll help you out with that <laughs> during my slide. Don't get very close. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. So again, everybody, this is ATOA Artist Talk on Art. Welcome. We have a great group, 61 people. Keep in mind there are cocktails to go with this. So enjoy them as we as you hear the presentations. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And thank you to all the artists who are so generous and inspiring with their work. And Lois, in particular, I'd like to thank you because you made it possible for me to think about 50 years of work and how the cosmos began for me in my life back in the 70s and took a very long journey through patterning and back to cosmos in my last show in September. So. I want to share that journey uh, with all of us tonight. So for me, I'm approaching the cosmos as a process and uh, a process of generosity because it does create an infinity of patterns. And the pattern you're looking at on the left is actually a photograph. A lot of my work these days is photographic. Um, and it also has been, it's a bush really that's been pushed through Photoshop and through some of the mathematical uh, programming inside that uh, technique. Uh, this is an early lithograph and it is um, from 1976 and there was a large body of work that I was doing around the love for a kind of an imaginary uh, connection to the cosmos, feeling one with it and whether it was round or square it was that pure form that was drawing me in. What I thought about when I was choosing these works was how important it is a scale, I see scale as a relationship actually. And so nothing is big or small, it's all in relation to what and whom. And that's really fascinating to me because, you know, in a way we have these hegemonies where we say, well, it's big, but that's only because I'm a certain size. If I were the moon, it may be small. So I think the relationship aspect, it really drew me in. Uh, th this is another early work. It's a watercolor um, from 1974. 
And it was inspired by something I was reading then, which many of us probably read, which was Joseph Campbell, the hero of a thousand faces and other works of mythology. And I pulled this out because we were talking about the Maoris of New Zealand and the Aborigines, how they think and dream the world. And I, I think this is such a beautiful concept. Um, and I think I'll just read it to you to get the flavor. And so they were seeing, looking up at the sky as I imagine them, and they were seeing the void, the first void, the second void, the vast void, the far extending void, the seer void, the unpossessing void, the delightful void, the void fast bound, the night, the hanging night, the drifting night, the moaning night, the daughter of troubled sleep, the dawn, the abiding day, the bright space, the bright day and the space. And I love that sequencing of coming closer, this movement back and forth. And the watercolor is an abstraction again. I was doing these kind of color field paintings, drawings, watercolor, uh, watercolors, and I want to show you these as a precursor to now, we're gonna jump 45 years, no, less than that. First we stopped, it's 1978. <laughs> um, as I was doing the, various grid-based works that many artists were doing at the time, this pattern painting popped out, which is like five by eight feet. And it, to me, it represented, um, it was taken from a, a postcard of a garden that I bought at the Brooklyn Museum. And it showed a garden and I kind of reduced it to getting closer into the garden and moving further back. So for me, it was sort of a, a I was teaching art then, it was a study in how artists had to choose between say uh, landscape and then if you get closer it's a still life you get really close you have abstraction and then when you get really close you have just texture and you have the cosmos again and that's the upper left hand square up here that is all just movement shimmering movement so it looking at this presentation made me think my goodness is it possible that scale is really circular it's a circle just like everything else we've seen tonight, it's, you know, it goes back from the minuscule to the gigantic back to the minuscule and it's, it's a beautiful shape. And I found that very exciting. I also um, was feeling the coming of the computer age, even though I know nothing about computers for another 20 years, but it, it felt like it was like an, a traumatic overabundance of patterns and I could barely deal with the work that I made. I could barely look at it. Now in 2021, I've totally accepted pattern. <laughs> And this was my last body of work. Um, and in this show, I tried to position a relationship between human ecosystem and the cosmos, because I, I feel like we've been through such a difficult time in the last few years, uh, politically, socially, ecologically, health-wise, that it was almost impossible to go on. So the next few slides are about these feelings and they, they consist of work from 19, uh, 2019 until 2021. So this was a part of the installation at AR Gallery. And this group was from a series started in uh, 2019 was called Interrupted Landscapes. And these are all photographic altered prints of the Delaware River near my studio and then maps drawn out of the images by shredding the image and then annotating the maps. And they all are on ec ecosystem themes. Um, for instance, one of them is called Mega Cities Rising. And um, I'm very interested in technology in the sense that we have the information at our fingertips that we need, but we won't look at it, we won't look for it. So I wanted to know uh, what is the danger of coastal cities and, and who does it affect? And all you have to do is get on your search engine and there it is. So there are pencil mappings around this islands, the islands that I pull out of my image on the upper level of these images. And, um, and I put in some factoids without you know, any particular opinion about them, but that 634 million people live along shorelines. Wow, that's, that's a lot of people if the sea rises and that New York City, has actually gone nine inches uh, into the water since 1950 when I came to America. <laughs> and then the, the, the altitude of coastal mega cities, a lot of the most important mega cities in the world that we know of are, some of them are just like 35 feet above sea level. So 
this whole body of work was a concern about our ecosystem and why aren't we seeing it? Why can't we seem to do anything about it? This was the second part of that group uh, a year later. And it was kind of a, a very sad group for me. It was going back to the wood. When we're in trouble, we go back to nature. We go back to wood branches and making talismans and, and little artworks and ple a pleading to the gods, whoever they may be, that we're in trouble. So the titles and the pieces, uh, winding fabric and, and uh, all kinds of braided ropes around these things, uh, the titles in, in the group on the left were Remember Me, Long Wait, and Too Bad. And that's sort of how I feel about our conditions as humans. Uh, the three larger pieces on the right were kind of bittersweet, um, thinking about the ocean, our planet, and our own species. The, the fabrics on them are both kind of ritualistic, but they're also wearables because the last few years, quite a few years actually, I've been making art that is on the wall, but also on the body. And I've been conflicted about does art belong on the body? Does it belong on the wall? What if there are no more walls? What if people don't have walls? Where does art belong? So these are works where you could wear the artwork, but you also have them as art when you're not wearing them. So you become an ambassador of the idea. And uh, this group was about human and it was about, uh, well, after the election, when we had, a, many of us took a deep breath and felt like we missed a bullet. Um, I made these pieces which were called these, the ropey pieces are actually neckwear, as you see in my own self portrait here. And they're called ashes and diamonds and they're kind of celebratory, but very, uh, I don't know, worn out celebratory. They're, they're shredded. And I paired it with a um, or kind of a, well, let's say the pins that all women tend to have from their mothers, their heirloom things from other centuries, other times that had all different kind of feeling about it. And so my thinking was that when you pin something that comes from our time, which is so full of anxiety and, and stress and with something beautiful from the past, like this Art Deco diamond pin when things may have been more hopeful for a while, that there's a conversation between time and we can wear that on our body and stimulate thinking about time and how things change. The images on the right side are supports and influence of Zoom as our lifeline for almost a year uh, because of the pandemic. So here's a detail of one of them and there are Zoom selfies. And when I went to use Zoom for social connection and projects, I realized that most of us were not even thinking about the background and made me wonder about that. It made me think, wow, we've been going through a selfie moment through Facebook and our, our digital tools for so long. Are we forgetting that there's a background? So does that mean anything? Is it telling us that we are, we're like Narcissus staring into the pool of water and in love with our beauty, which we are beautiful, but that beauty in that myth led to death. And so if we don't incorporate the background, if we don't look at the ecosystem, if we don't look at the cosmos, if we don't see the relationship that we're part of a process, we're not here by ourselves, we may not uh, survive it. So for, Let's see if we're up to that. No, one more. Okay. And the third body of work is plan B in the story. It's infinity loops and terrestrial stars. Mm -hmm. And these are photographic prints of nature that have been put through my Photoshop you know, skills. And they are abstract patternings. Um, and in talking about them with a friend, she, she gave me some wonderful reflections about them. And made me feel so much better. Um, and um, I'll try to read that for those that maybe are doing this on a small laptop. A meditation on technical images as stars that are here among us, nestled in the leaves, in the underbrush, but compiled in the polyhedron patterning of the digital. A cosmic topology, echoes of the universe here on our home planet. The infinite as a variable reflected in the velocity of repetitions, playing with gods. That's Suzanne Bybee 
and who's often very inspiring to talk to for me. And, and now I will come to my last work, which um, this is a little video that shows you the title on those pieces and it has a, a, a gong for a soundtrack by Mark Swithko. Um, you may or may not be able to hear it very well because for some reason uh, these technologies do not do sound too well, but I will play it. It's uh, about a minute long. So let's see if we can do this. <laughs> That was lovely. That was really nice. I can hear that. Very good, Daria. Um, let me see. Just I uh, did just want to show you this. Just if you need to know more about this, you can find me on Instagram where you can jump around all my images and definitely you can email me or look at the video again on Vimeo. Just look me up on Vimeo. So thank you very much. That's good. Beautiful. Thank you, Gary. That was very nice. We're going to move on to Andra Samuelson. Again, everybody, there are lots of nice comments in the chat. Feel free to add to it. Um, ATLA is a 501c3. All our talks are free. If you'd like to contribute, all of our information is on the website as well. A YouTube of this talk will be up shortly uh, within a day or two. So Andra Samuelson, we look forward. And uh, again, my apologies for having to rush everybody along. It's obvious each of these artists could have presented for an hour. Um, lots of content tonight and also a great diversity of presentations on the cosmos. Andra? So thank you, Barry, and thank you, Lois, so much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel. And I'm honored to be included with such wonderful artists. Um, so I came across a photo of myself taken in my very first studio in New York City almost 50 years ago, just after graduating from college. Um, in back of me, pinned to the wall, is an immense map of the night sky. Andrew, Andrew, do you want a yes. screen share? Do you want a screen share? I, I will in a moment. Okay. Yes, I'm going to do that. Um, so it seems that the subject of the cosmos has been of interest to me for many, many years. Um, and uh, in the many years that have followed, I have continued to explore this cosmic theme in, in my prints and my drawings and my sculpture and installation. Um, in 2000, I was invited to create a sculpture at the Stone Quarry Hill Art Park in upstate New York in a show called Earth's Altars. At the time, I was reading a wonderful book that I highly recommend by an astronomer called Chuck Ramos called The Soul of the Night. Uh, when I came across a quote by Thoreau that jumped right out of the page at me, quote, I cannot see to the bottom of the sky because I cannot see to the bottom of myself. It is a symbol of my own infinity. And what particularly struck me about these words were quartz infinity, but also the bottom of the sky. So I've had the idea to bring uh, what was on the top uh, to the bottom or ground. And I created a 25 foot diameter night sky that became the, off, uh, the um, offering on my earth's altar. And I'm gonna screen share. Hmm. Um, this work is entitled Ephemeris, and it, which means a table given the calculated positions of a celestial object at regular intervals. 
And of course, I, in this case, this is a wooden table that I created. Um, all the stars on ephemeris are made of mirrors and acetate, do acetate domes, which reflect the actual sky and its activity. Um, let me just get this here. Uh, here's an example of, of the actual sky being reflected in one of the mirrors, as well as myself taking a picture of it. Um, since the reflections are constantly changing, this work emphasizes impermanence and the supremacy of the present moment, as well as offering the actual and metaphorical experience of our connection to the cosmos. Um, ephemeris was recreated in uh, using different materials and slightly larger at the University of Virginia uh, on view from 2002 to 2004. Again, here's an image of one of the acetate domes or planets or stars reflecting the actual sky and the photographer. And here I am in the middle of the universe. <laughs> I wanted to share some images using um, of my work that use different media and sizes and formats to explore this cosmic theme. I'll, I'll go quickly since we don't have a lot of time. I did a series of work on paper called Celestial Seasonings. And here are a few images of that. And then I went on to create some larger work on a material called styrene, again with the cosmic theme. In 2013, I was given a large one person exhibition uh, for four months at the Loyola University Museum of Art in Chicago. Um, and I wanted to share some images of that exhibition. Uh, the show was entitled Cosmologies. There were 54 works in the show and this is, was the main gallery. There were uh, two floor installations and wall drawings, sculpture, digital prints. This is called Buddha Pada. It is an eight by six foot rendering on muslin with pins of the Buddha's footprint, referencing the night sky. This was a floor mandala that I created. Again, you can see I used the materials that I had um, used to create ephemeris. And the acetate domes reflect the entire show as well as the people observing it. This was a 20 foot uh, draw, uh, wall drawing of, uh, called Buddha that uh, again references the night sky. This was a piece called Pema Ram that was an eight foot lotus that was created by 1300 CDs. Uh, it was lit in such a way that rainbow light was reflected on the adjacent walls and the ceiling. Mm. This was another piece in the show made of 16 um, round canvases called Out of the Blue. I also did a series, uh, a portfolio of 10 pigment prints that were digitally created from uh, paintings. And it was also called uh, Cosmologies. And here, here are a few examples. Um, some of the artists tonight are focusing on the physical material aspects of the cosmos, but I told Lois that my work had, um, has emphasized the immaterial spiritual dimension of the cosmos. I believe that anytime we can connect and identify with a larger, impersonal, um, infinite, mysterious universe, rather than this small, finite, impermanent, temporary self, we open our minds to a spiritual dimension. 
we all know that starlight takes so long to reach us that sometimes the actual stars are no longer there. Some galaxies are so far away that they can only appear to us through their reflection in mirror-like stardust. I think to begin to deeply contemplate these thoughts is to propel our minds into a spiritual dimension. Um, as probably some of you have been reading, scientists have been saying for some time that the universe is composed of 27% dark matter and 68% dark energy. And the rest, everything on earth, everything ever observed with all of our scientific instruments, what we call normal matter, adds up to less than 5% of the universe. So almost everything is a mystery. Mm. I have been interested in the concept and reality of this mysterious dark energy and dark matter that I would also call emptiness for many years. In 2001, I created a series of uh, large works on mat board called Next to Nothing, uh, some of which were on view in 2019 in Odetta Gallery's exhibition entitled Transcendental. In my work, I am interested in the space between things, in gaps and openings that articulate this vibrant emptiness. Uh, dots show up a lot in my work. Fugitive dots and shifting dotted lines appear uh, that, that shift the focus between inside and outside space, uh, emphasizing their inseparability. Um, I think of what Kandinsky said, whose beautiful cosmic painting we saw earlier in the panel, uh, that everything begins with a dot. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, um, lastly, I would like to share some, uh, just a few more images of some more recent paintings done during the pandemic. In closing, I would like to read some of my favorite words um, by the poet Stephen Mitchell. The sense of proportion. There are at least 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Each galaxy contains at least 100 billion stars. Each star illuminates an uncounted number of planets each of which may support inconceivable forms of life. From most points of view, the green earth is smaller than an electron. All this is happening within your mind. Thank you. Very nice, as all the performances, or all the discussions have been tonight. Um, let's move to Sandra Taggart. This will be our last artist to present, and then we'll go to Lois, and we'll open it up to more of a discussion. But thanks so much, everybody. Welcome, Sandra. I'm gonna ask you to unmute, Sandra. I'm unmuting, I'm unmuting. It's working. Okay, um, I just want to say hello to everyone and thank you, Barry and Lois and all the great artists who preceded me tonight and everyone in the, uh, out there in the world where there seem to be a lot of you. Uh, I, like everyone else, am going to talk about what I've learned about the universe and my, I particularly am going to talk about how the universe creates itself on the cosmic scale. My quest to understand what seemed unknowable began with a biblical inquiry. This did not provide useful answers. And since my questions got me into trouble, I switched to science. Now I have a reasonable grasp of the history of the universe. To expand my understanding of the metaphysics of our existence, I continue to read physicists and poets. 
People commonly think of the universe and its objects as something apart from us. However, the universe is everything. From the most distant light to particles smaller than atoms, <clears throat> everything is part of the universe. Drawing, painting, and performance are my way of elucidating and sharing my understanding of the universe. It is good to keep in mind that we are in and of the universe. The Nicaraguan poet Ernesto Cardinal wrote, we come from the stars and to them we shall return. The cosmos knocks my socks off. That which began in the void has become incredibly splendid. Bear with me a minute so that I can share my screen. I am having a little trouble. Oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, this is all new here in San Miguel. Okay. Um, right hand, right hand, right hand image. No. Oh. Go to the zoom icon. The Sandra zoom does icon. have an assistant helping her out. Yeah, well, I've lost. Oh, here it is. Well, my hand keeps wobbling. It's a big problem. That, right, that one? Mm hmm Click on it. Then this should be share on the bottom. Okay, got it. Screen two. Share on the bottom right hand. I do want to point out, oh, there we go. go Sorry ahead. about You're up. Okay. Uh, so my first universe project, I created a graphic book entitled A Sketchbook for a Short History of the Universe. The book contains drawings of my understanding of and metaphors for his, the history and future of the universe. It is on the screen now, fortunately. The book has been has very few words, and I am presenting it without any comment, as, as if you were reading it alone. Can you slow it down just a bit? No, I can't. It's it's uh, it's all pre-done. I thought it was too fast though, so I'm glad somebody asked. <laughs> Beyond the book, the variation and beauty of deep space inspired me uh, to make drawings and paintings that interpret some of the phenomena of the, in the cosmos. This first image is of a gas cloud giving birth to stars. 
to make the, my, the drawings, I use colored pen, colored pencil, heightened with gel pen, and uh, sometimes with uh, whiteout, actually. For the paintings, I use flash paint, gel pen, crystals, and glitter on canvas. The, the very early universe consisted primarily of hydrogen and helium. Gravity pulls these gases together, compressing them into clouds called nebulae. Further gravitational attraction makes the clouds collapse. As a cloud collapses, the temperature increases and causes the cloud to fragment. Each, each fragment is a potential star. When a fragment reaches a temperature of 10,000 degrees Kelvin, it begins to look like a star and fusion reactions begin. The second image shows this process continuing. It continues until the materials of the original gas cloud is exhausted. The nebula no longer exists. The stars created from it are in a cluster. In addition, in the cluster, planets are forming. Gravity holds stars, planets, gas, dust, and dark matter together. As other clouds get close, gravity continues to act, sending these objects careening into one another and knitting them together into a large spinning group. This formation is a galaxy. Many galaxies are disks with spiral arms. Our galaxy is one of these, as is our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy shown here. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 100 billion stars. We can see it in the night sky from places on Earth where there is no light pollution. Because we rarely get to see this in urban areas, I have included a number of my portraits of the Milky Way, which I will show you now. Some of these have details that we cannot see from any place on earth. Galaxies also form clusters. Scientists think that galaxy clusters form when, when gravity pulls clumps of dark matter and galaxies together to form groups of dozens of galaxies. These in turn merge to form clusters of hundreds and even thousands of galaxies. The universe is not eternal, therefore it too will eventually die. Death happens regularly on a smaller than universe scale. For instance, stars die. When a star runs out of fuel to create fusion, it begins to collapse. Small stars like the sun have beautiful deaths. They pass through a phase where they become an expanding glowing shell that outer layers, layers drift away, leaving a shining core that will eventually become a black dwarf. The deaths of massive stars, on the other hand, are, are spectacular. These stars explode. This is a supernova. The explosion scatters fragments across the cosmos. A very dense star known as a neutron star remains. If the star is extremely large, it can form a black hole. Billions of years from now, the universe, which is constantly expanding, will run out of material to build and fuel stars. It will cool off completely. Only the void will remain. As for us, we will be long gone. Then my question for you is, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was very provocative and wonderful imagery of the solar systems. Beautiful. Thank you. Now, I think we've 
we've kind of achieved, we're close to the hour and a half and we're only at four minutes over. <laughs> and you've been so patient and thank you for seeing all this wonderful work, all the work that's really uh, intensely um, thought about by the artists. If there's some questions, we can continue for a very short time. Would you agree, Barry? I know that it's been a long evening, but I hope a worthwhile evening. And I'm now supposed to read the chat. <laughs> so let me get out of the full screen. If anybody wants to spontaneously ask a question, please do. Let me read this. I recommend that. Just jump in, unmute yourself. We'll take a few questions and just let the conversation go. I don't mind go going a little bit over. We did start five minutes after. And we'll let go of the chat as far as reading it. There's just so many great things. I leave that to everybody to just read on their own. But go ahead. If you'd like, unmute yourself. Break into a thought or a question, anything you like. I'd love to know uh, how you got to gather yourselves in this way to have so many artists working on the same theme. Well, I was inspired by my my work is ba basically my practice basically has evolved in the in the of the four elements in water and earth, and I have actually not really done too many works with the the air and the sky and the fire sign, and I I started to look at the heavens. One of the sim one of the prompts I had was Joni Mitchell, who's talking about back to the garden, and one of her prominent lines is "We are stardust." which is you know, a quick phrase, but it's such a profound, deep, cosmic phrase about how we are just at one with everything else in the world, in the universe. So I started to think of the sky and the cosmos, and I looked at the artists in my circle, friends, and I even went to a show that Daria had in the fall, and her show was about cosmologies, and it kind of coalesced where I found six artists that have different um, specialities in dealing with the, cosmo the cosmos, some more of the earth and the cosmos, some specifically with the heavens. So the reach was fascinating and interesting. It's been so much fun working with this subject matter that isn't my wheelhouse, but I really appreciate it and enjoy seeing how everybody handled it. And uh, maybe we'll have a show eventually. But I hope that answered your question. You know, you want to just be curious and think about other things that fascinate you. And you may be able to pull together and curate um, a talk, a show, et cetera. Thank you. And uh, just in case you don't know, uh, Joni was uh, just uh, got the Kennedy, Kennedy Center honors. Yes, I saw that. And there was such a wealth of Jonies and Jones. <laughs> but. We are all flower children <laughs> grown up, right? Any other questions? Any other comments? Well, I just I just looked at the chat and, and saw Karen Fitzgerald's question to all of us, and I would like to second that. I think it's wonderful. What do you wonder about when you look up at the night sky? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder where you are, who you are. How big is it, for example? <laughs> just the mystery of it all. That's what I wonder, just the mystery. That keeps coming back every time you look up. Well, very nice thoughts, everybody. I think what struck me is the sort of variety of angles each person used to get into something about the cosmos. We had a sort of scientific, a description of how stars and universes and galaxies sort of come into being. We had some historical references to how, you know, to previous artwork. Um, we had uh, even a personal approach where hand prints and body prints were used. Um, we had some discussions about macro and micro. I think the similarity was there was a very high level of skill and creativity that each of the artists used. And uh, I, I can't but point this out. You know, there's a lot been made about, uh, you know, gender, about how too many male artists are presented. And that's so true of the history of art. But take a look at this panel, six women, six brilliant women and one woman moderator. And, you know, we can't do much about the past, but if we look at the present, 
women are a strong force in the art world. They're not just painting women in boats and nice dresses. No offense to Mary Cassatt, but you are doing some heavy thinking, some very creative thinking. And I, I, I think that's one of the takeaways, really so many. You know, keep coming back. We're here every Monday. We have a change of format coming in 2022. Our time will start at seven o'clock. There'll be a new Zoom link. The Zoom link's not on the website yet, but do go to the website. That'll keep you abreast of what's going on. We're going to have a series of different moderators as well. If anybody wants to organize a talk or be part of a talk, look through our website. You'll see how you can reach out to us. You'll see my email. If you don't see anything else, just reach out to me and I'll forward it to Jackie Ratta, who will then send you a form so you can organize a talk. Again, we're a 501c3. All our talks are free. If Maybe it's the fifth time I'm saying it, but if you'd like to contribute, it's mm -hmm. certainly welcome. Thank you so much, everybody. This was a, a, a great night. I hope you all enjoyed your drinks. Thank you, Lois, for putting this together and all the artists for presenting. We hit our record. This is the silver medal for the number of people. We were at 62 people at one point on this Zoom. And I think that's pretty impressive that it speaks to you, Lois, and to each of the artists. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank Round you. of applause thank for everyone. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Good Thanks, night, everybody. Night. Think of the solstice tomorrow. As... <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks, Lois. Lois. And Barry. Right. Thank you. Great thank job. you, Barry, for me. Thank you. I was listening. It was we a met. wonderful evening. Very, very inspiring. Wonderful evening. Fantastic. Yeah, it was. It was very great. Oh, thank, thank you. you. You are Thank you, Lois. Thank you. A beautiful a job. To go into the solstice. <laughs> fantastic. What a fantastic group. Yeah. yeah.